registered for today's session. This session is also eligible for a uh, contact hour for those of you that are watching it live, and the link to that uh, certificate will be available towards the end of the session. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Susan. So glad to see everyone here. Happy Tuesday, and thank you so much for joining us here today. It's um, late in the day, and um, I know it's a long work day, so really pleased to be here. Um, and I've known many, I've known some of you in different capacities. And um, so today I'm here with the Maine Department of Education. So welcome. Oh, I was going to say next slide, but I'm the one who's controlling the slide. So let's see. And then um, I also like to make these somewhat interactive, even though we're doing this via Zoom. So um, feel free to put comments in the chat. I'll be trying to look at the ch chat and, or um, if I don't see you raising your hand or if Emily could keep track of that, um, that would be great. So how many, we're gonna be talking about McKinney Vento and homeless students. So. How many of you know a student who didn't have a home or ran away or was kicked out or you worried about them or you knew they didn't have heat or was in a home that was overcrowded or stayed in a hotel or motel um, that you really have bent over backwards for students like that? How many of you done that? Um, you know, you can raise your, well, you can put your thumbs up or raise your hand or just note in the chat. How many of you spent your own money to help students um, like that? Or how many of you wish that there were more resources in your town um, and your community and your school for students like that? Um, yeah, thank you for raising your hand on the, um, the Zoom. For those of you who are um, not having your video on and still raising your hand, um, I appreciate your involvement, but we can't see you. So any way you can point that out and share with us is great. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, and you, as you know, make a difference. And um, so we are very thankful. I can tell you personally that uh, my daughter survived um, middle school and particularly, you know, middle, I'm sorry, elementary and high school, thanks to a nurse and that was in her life. So um, nurses do make a difference. Um, you're the ones who notice whether attendance is sporadic. Parents may call out the child for being sick. Um, you know, it's the school nurse who will go in and check on them. You know, that if they have, the child has asthma or um, what, what happens with the child um, really can make a difference. So the school nurse, for example, may check in with the child because they're suddenly absent and the mom says the asthma is really triggered for them. Um, which seems kind of surprising and says, well, now they're living around um, pets and you know they didn't have pets before. So all of a sudden, as you're talking, you're realizing that she's staying with her sister. The student and the family is staying with the um, mother's sister. That's a chance to know that something's going on with that child and that they may be homeless. Next slide. Oops, that's me. Sorry, I'm so used to doing this with other people and having somebody work on the slide. So how many of you are familiar with the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act? You know, like number one is what is this? And number five is I'm a pro. I know everything about it. So put it in the chat. That's so funny. So people seem to know a little bit, a lot of twos, some threes. It ranges. So thank you for letting me know. Appreciate it. So this is a chance to learn more. This is sort of your golden opportunity. So just to give you a real quick background, McKinney Vinto has been around since 1987. It's crazy that it's been around and sometimes for for a lot of people, um, it's surprising that it's been around for so long. It was the first and remains the only major federal response to homelessness. So um, it's passed and really what it's done, um, and it was 
McKinney Vinto was named after the two um, senators that sponsored it and died soon after. And so the act was named after them. Um, but it was really about how do we keep kids in school when their housing situation is not permanent? Um, and how do we make sure that there are certain things in place for students who are homeless? So as part of the Homeless Assistance Act, every homeless, there's a, every state has a homeless education coordinator. So it's somebody who provides technical assistance about those state and federal policies, funding for districts, professional development, and here for you. Um, the, I just want to make a copy for you in the chat so that you'll know that's where the website is, um, the main DOE website on homelessness. Um, Amelia Lyons, who many of you know, was the homeless state coordinator, and now um, she has moved on to a different position. She's still involved with it, but Signe Lynch who um, has an extensive experience um, with the homeless population, particularly in Central Maine, um, is the interim coordinator. So we have some great people there. So every district, every school district has a mckinney vento liaison, and that's part of the state legislation. So do you know who your mckinney vento um, liaison is. How many of you know who your McKinney-Vento liaison is? You can either put a thumbs up or in the chat. How many of you know who your district liaison is? Every district has one. So next slide. Oh, I keep doing that. Sorry. Oh, shoot. Um, this is where you look it up. Um, on where, who is the district, McKinney-Vinto district liaison is. You can um, go on here and you can select it. Don't worry that you don't know. Now's your golden opportunity to know who is this link? Who is this person? Um, and, and how do I get to know them better and what they can offer? So, and we, um, in the last two years, we've created this really nice to look up on the website. So it's really easy to find out who it is. And for families or for anybody's staff, they don't have to memorize um, the RSUs in Maine. They just look it up by town and then somebody's name comes up. So. Hi, this is Angel. Hi, Angel, it's Marilee. Hi. So. So. So let me just give you an example. So there's a middle school showing up at the nurse's office regularly before PE with a stomach ache. But you also notice that they're walking with a slight limp. So they're not going to PE. They always seem to get a stomach ache and they're walking with a, a slight limp. As you get to know this student, you dive a little deeper and the child discloses that their shoes are too small. Um, but they don't want to bother their mother right now because they were recently evicted and you're staying with an aunt and it's a really hard time and and students are really protective over their families because they know the parents trying to do what they can and they're working, but it wasn't enough to avoid eviction. So they turn to you. When you find this out, you could actually turn to your, um, your district liaison because this student is not participating in gym. They are not able to participate in their educational program because of these lack of funds. And so they might be able to access some shoes that will allow them to join their gym class. There's Title I set-aside funds for students who are homeless and eligible under McKinney-Vento. That's just a very specific example of how you can use the McKinney-Vento fund. So here's a form um, for back to school paperwork. Anybody seen it? So this is the new enrollment pay, um, paperwork. You can have it online. Is it available online in your school district? Um, do you have reminders about this? If not, you can ask your liaison, where do we find it? Um, and, and you can find out, you know, as a family. And it and and I and it doesn't go out with some schools, but um, some schools choose not to have this go out. But they have something that 
says you can contact somebody specifically, but the school secretary should have this and should be able to have um, offer this um, to every new family that comes through the door. So it's a question you can ask about your McKinney-Vinto screener form. How available is it? So I, I have another story for you. Um, so here's a student that's checking in with a nurse regularly. And you learn as the nurse that the student was living in the family car. Um, um, but now they've recently moved to a family friend's house in the next district. Since moving there, this student has been coming to school regularly. Um, and it also feels like sometimes they're wearing the same clothes over and over again. Um, and, and so what do you do? Do you just say, oh, you have to go to that other district? No, under McKinney-Vento, if a student is homeless, they have the right to remain in their school of origin. They have the right to stay with the school where they have these connections. And then the schools, the school of origin and where the school is now and the district where they now reside have to pay to transport this student. Sometimes it's really easy to figure out and sometimes it takes a little bit more work to figure out. But trans students have the right and to continue with their school of origin where they have a connection to their teacher and all the staff there. Any questions, any thoughts? Does everybody realize that you can do that? And sometimes when students don't have everything right in front of them then and don't have a shower facility, sometimes what we also try to work out is how can we use a shower facility in the school? How can we make sure that that student has breakfast before they start classes? How do we make sure if there is a washing machine there, maybe that student who's homeless can access the washing machine just to get clean clothes? There are things that we can do. There's, there are certain things um, within our sphere of control, and then there's certain things that are not within our sphere of control. We may not be able to find them that new housing that we'd like to get them, but we can try to provide support within the school um, that we do have. So what the local, um, this is something that a student said, and I just thought, sometimes people feel like judgment is being made on them. You know, they say they're homeless and they're afraid to say that because people are judging them. And here's a, here's a youth that said, I wish my teachers knew that my mom was doing the best she could. She's working three jobs and we still don't have a stable place to live. It's so easy to judge people for what they don't have rather than recognize what they do have. So, and, and we all really are a step away from being homeless, you know? If, if you experienced a flood, a fire, or a natural disaster, would you experience homelessness? Do you live in a place where your pipes could freeze? Do you work where you might lose a job? Or you suffer from a long-term illness, or you've lost a job and, and you've got a family member who has a long-term illness that has great costs to that. Um, are, and the housing costs are rising faster than, than what you could earn. Um, or do you know of, of staff in your school that could be, or friends? Um, and, and what's really interesting is a recent survey found out that 44% of Americans could afford a thousand dollar emergency expense. That meant that 56% of Americans couldn't. So that means we're all just a step away from being homeless. Maine is in the eighth in the nation for, um, homeless, homelessness by population. Is that surprising to anyone? You know, sometimes we have to sit back and you see it every day, but this is really what we're living with. 
So a reflection, if your home was flooded and no longer available, where would you go? Or, and would you want, is there a place in your same school district? What happens if you can't get to your same school district, but you know your kids have connections? If you experience flooding or a fire or some eviction, what's the one thing you want? You want some way to maintain that routine. So that's why we're changing the narrative. We want to get the word out on McKinney Vento as a resource for everyone in our community. We want to make sure that everyone knows. So, and, you know, this is really the power of McKinney Vento because I know if something happened when my kids were in school, that was their connection, their teachers, their friends. That was so important to maintain that connection. So here's a, um, a poster that was recently developed in the last year. And it was developed um, as a result of focus groups by uh, with youth. And they said, this is the message that we want um, to use to reach out. And we will send it via um, Emily and Sarah, you know, how you can access, or you could just go on the website and you can access these posters and just, um, download them and put them up in your schools so families can see it. But just to let people know you can stay in your current um, school. You can access free schools, school supplies, transportation. Um, and you can also consent to your own medical and mental health. But that also means that um, not having your immunization charts right there cannot keep you away from your school if you're homeless, if you're under El McKinney Vento. You may not have access to all that information and that should not interfere or interrupt, be a cause to interrupt your education. So let's look at this house. Homelessness is defined as lacking a fixed, regular and adequate nighttime residence. If somebody lived in this house, um, could they be eligible for McKinney Vento and under what circumstances? Put it in the chat or just unmute. What do you think? You drive by this house, you say, oh, they live there. Could What could be the circumstances? Yep, thanks, Miranda. No heat or electricity. It's unsafe. They're staying with others. That's right. There could be um, three families living in here and people are living on the floor. It's not their home. And they could be staying with people who could kick them out at any moment. That's exactly it. So just because we see the outside of a house doesn't mean we can judge what's going on. Uh, this is from one of the liaisons in RSU 16. I don't know if there's somebody here from RSU 16 in the Poland area. Um, a parents said to them, I never thought we would need help like this. And I didn't want to ask, but I can't hide it anymore because I can't get the kids to school. And it reminded Jenny that of the importance of compassion, and empathy, as well as identification. Who are we missing? How could one conversation make all the difference? So the conversations you have with families can really make that difference. Um, and I, I can tell you the story. We were doing a, a youth focus, uh, not a youth focus, a youth panel. And one youth said, um, I lived in a box and in a shelter and I was embarrassed to tell anybody. I was so embarrassed to tell anybody what our conditions and, and how we were kicked out and how unfair it was, um, that I stayed in school for as long as I could. I joined activities just so that I could have a place to go because being in school meant that I had a semblance of normalcy. So it took him over a year to share with somebody that he needed help um, aside from the people in the shelter. So your conversations and the work that you do, do make a difference. So just remember, move this. 
Homelessness means, can they be in the same place? Is it fixed every night? Is it regular place to sleep in? And if is it, is it a safe and sufficient space? Is it adequate? So let's think about what that means. So raise your hand if you know of a student who's been in this situation, sleeping on the couch. They're sleeping on somebody else's couch. I, I certainly have. Yeah, they said, nope, someone already bought them. I know, but so, I thought that you weren't gonna buy Oh, <laughs> um, so this is a sign of homelessness if somebody has to stay on the couch. That sharing housing due to loss of um, housing economic hardship or a similar reason. How about this, staying in a hotel? Anybody know of a student? Does your lease? on know about them living in a hotel motel and due to lack of inadequate housing does your liaison know about them and know um talk to them about supports another um support to support an educational um programming of a student could be something simple like in high school you know those really expensive math calculators they're like a hundred dollars that's something that your title one set aside could cover because that allows a student to participate in, in school. What about this? How about in a trailer? You know, a trailer made for the summer, but they're living in, in it for the winter. That's lack of adequate housing. This is all makes somebody eligible for McKinney-Vento or living in emergency or transitional shelter, whether it's a family shelter or um, a youth shelter or living in their car, public spaces or abandoned buildings. These are all examples of substandard housing. And, and what examples? It's sort of what you were talking about before. Do they have inadequate heat or electricity or water? Um, unsafe heat, heat sources, um, kitchen or plumbing. Somebody may not think of themselves as homeless, but they're eligible for McKinney-Vento under these conditions. Also migratory students living in one of the previously mentioned um, situations. And we have migratory students throughout the state. Sometimes, you know, like here, you know, in Portland, we think, oh, no, 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 we don't have any migratory students, but we do students who come in for a certain harvest or for like eels, what are they called? Alwives. Again, we wanna remember, can the student go to the same place every night and is it safe and sufficient space? Think of it as far, fixed, adequate, and regular. Easy way to remember it, fixed, adequate, and regular. This is what another liaison said, how the child came into their office defeated. He said, I never asked to be in this situation. What do I do now? And she always keeps that in mind as she works with families and youth. Have you ever felt that way? So there are rights of um, McKinney-Vento students. There's tutoring, there's expedited evaluations, there's professional development to all staff. Make sure your colleagues are aware of this. There's referral services. There's early childhood education. Um, there's services before and after. Even in Head Start, there's priority for students who are homeless. Um, there's um, activities to address needs of kids from who have been experiencing domestic violence or mental health. There's space and school supplies. Sometimes in some schools, what they do is they find just a locker or some place where students can leave their things in a locked space. So these are all the things that schools can offer. Anybody can think of something else that they've offered? It, 
You can add it in the chat. Remember the transportation to the school of origin. That's so important. It's not always easy to do, but it's so important. They can also, the Title I set aside for McKinney-Vento can also help pay for school supplies and um, before and after school mentoring or fees for accessing records and support for those who are not familiar with the FAFSA, it's for the um, financial aid um, for post-secondary education. Any questions, thoughts? So then the question comes up, what's the time frame? So every year a, a student must be documented each year, but the child is el eligible for McKinney-Vento services through the academic year, even if they become stably housed partway through the year. So if a student was unhoused in August and September and then becomes permanently housed in October, they're still considered McKinney-Vento and eligible for those supports, transportation, whatever it is, throughout the year. Um, if a student continues to be homeless over multiple years, then they're still eligible for McKinney-Vento services over multiple years. Any questions? Thoughts? So there is no time limit on how long a child or youth can be considered homeless. So this is the numbers. So in 2021, 2.7% of US high school students experienced homelessness. So that's total student homelessness for Maine was um, almost 5,000 students. And that was the number for just a 30 day period, not an entire day, not entire year. So it's incredible, the number of students. You'll see that over the last um, seven years that there's been um, an increase. It doesn't necessarily mean, and this happens nationally, this is not necessarily an increase and in, suddenly there's an increase in the number of students who are homeless, but we're getting better at identifying them, which is good because then those students get the supports they need. Um, um, thank you, Nurse Sherman, that the student, um, about a student who lost housing in another district has moved in with mom's friend in this district. Is the student eligible? Yes, because that may not be fixed, adequate, or regular housing. They may have moved in, but at any point, that's, that family could be kicked out. I can't tell you how many times families have said, I'm moving my child over to this. I'm kicking my child out of this house. They're moving to this other house in a different school district. And they said, everything's all set, but it's temporary because it, you know, two months later, that student might get kicked out again. Um, but I'm glad that you asked because that means that you can reach out to the liaison and get the student the support. Because if they, if they moved mid-year, think about what that means for any student. You know, I mean, we all depend on our routines and our, our connections. And if your life is disrupted, what it might mean for that student to stay in their school of origin, at least to finish the year. Or if you think about a high school student in um, moving mid-semester, that's really can be disruptive because um, oftentimes when students have high mobility, the teacher may teach um, in one school, they have a certain curriculum they've got to cover. And in one school, they teach it in a different order. They teach, um, they have A, B, C, D to cover. But in one school, it's covered A, C, B, D. That's how the, the teacher covers it. Student moves halfway through that school um, year. And all of a sudden, that school, that teen moves into a new school. And suddenly, there the teacher teaches it in a different order. And all of a sudden, 
they don't get the complete year. They don't get all the topics that are covered in that year. So one teacher is at, teaches at ABCD and the other one teaches at ACDB, ACBD. And so that child gets topic B twice, but never hears about C. Does that make sense? Thanks. <laughs> so this is based on McKinney Vento by living situation. You can see doubled up is the most common um, type of homeless situation. So before I show you the next slide, which um, age group do you think has the highest level of um, homelessness? Pre-K, elementary, or secondary? Just throw it in the chat or shout it out. What do you think? Secondary? Looks like a couple of votes for secondary. What do people think? Secondary, but it's underreported. All right, Christy, you got it. It's elementary, it's families. It's oftentimes we think of homelessness, we think of the unaccompanied youth, but actually the higher number is the primary, kindergarten through eighth grade. So we can't, but families don't often like to talk about it. And so um, just remember, it's not just the unaccompanied youth. If I had chocolate, I'd throw the chocolate to Christy for getting that right. How are we doing? Thumbs up? Check in. Are we good? All right, thanks for letting me know. Any questions? So if there's any questions, just throw them in the chat. So unaccompanied youth are those youth who are there without their guardian. So you have the Venn diagram, unaccompanied youth and McKinney-Vento eligible. Not all unaccompanied youth are homeless. There might be somebody who moves in with a family. They've been there for five years. One, one somebody's telling me a recent story about how a family, um, they kind of became part of that family and the family, um, their adopted family, so to speak, um, actually built an, uh, an addition and, and created a room for them. Um, sometimes, um, Unaccompanied youth end up in their own apartment. It's all, they have a job that's very steady. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why unaccompanied youth might be very stable uh, or are not considered homeless. So not all unaccompanied youth are considered homeless. So look for potential signs of homelessness, you know, you hear so much um, as families and, and students come to your offices. They hear about talking about leaving where they're staying or staying with other people, you know, being in a public place, talking about it being really cold at night. And then you find out later that they might be living in um, their car, that they have unmet hygiene or medical dental needs. They're wearing the same clothes. You notice these things. These are the things that we look out for or they're falling asleep. You hear about the student who's falling asleep in class because they're not sleeping at night because of, of their, their um, housing situation or they've been, um, they can't participate in a field trip or um, enrollment in multiple schools. There's a high rate of high mobility. Check in with your district liaison. Check in with the team that's working with um, students. So these are things you can do, you know, speak, find the person who has the connection with the student family, can speak with them privately. Not all families want to announce it publicly. So, you know, you're often that trusted soul. So speak to the family, connect with them in a caring way, you know, and ask permission um, to ask questions because some people may not want to share it, you know, and, and avoid those, what we might what families might consider judgmental decisions. Well, don't you have any choice? Why did you get evicted? 
um, and explain the reasons why, how this information can help you access support for the family. And just actively listen sometimes, because sometimes you can't solve everything, but you can actively listen. So key takeaways. You don't always have to use the, the word homeless. You can say doubled up. Keep an eye out for cues that a student is living in a temporary inadequate living situation. So, and, and what is a double debt through that loss of housing and, and how they can support them to succeed in school. Get to know your local liaison. I'm wondering if we can take a moment and, um, Emily, do you think we can break people up into small groups? We surely can try. Um, we have a question in the chat. Oh. If a student willingly leaves their parent um, or guardian home, do they qualify? I think you need to understand better what's going on. Sometimes when we talk about willingly, um, the family may say, oh, they can come back, but they have to do this, this, and this. Or a lot of times what happens is people are leaving willingly because it's a safety mechanism. They're leaving because it's not safe in the home. And it's easier to say, I can't live there anymore um, because people don't want to talk about what's happening in the home. So I think that it's um, a, a, a conversation that you need to have with the family. And you need to have with the student. Rarely do people leave because they want to live on the, somebody else's couch, you know, like that's not typically, you know, living on the streets is not something somebody wants to do willingly. It's something that they're, they're in a position where they've been forced to do it in some, because of circumstances. So, um, I think you really need to explore and understand what's going on with that student. Um, so do you want to do breakout rooms? Um, Any other questions that come up before this? Oops. Let's see other questions. Wait a second. I just wanted to break out into small groups and I just wondered, you know, maybe groups of five. Okay. Um, and people could talk about whether or not they have, they know their liaison um, and if they have, how would they use them? And if not, um, how could you use it? Or what, um, how could you use it? And if you have further questions about the whole McKinney Vento, does that make sense? So if you can think about it, just think about, um, have you used your liaison? If you haven't, how could you use your liaison? And if you have further questions about the whole McKinney Vinto. So if we give people, I don't know, eight minutes. Yep, and then come back. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna pause our recording and then I'll make the. This meeting is being recorded. So any insights, what are ahas, questions you have, you can unmute or just put it in the chat. I was just um, sharing with my group that um, it, may, it might just be specific to being in South Portland, um, but I would say probably 90% of our McKinney-Vento students are also new Mainers. Um, so in addition to working with the McKinney-Vento liaison, we have um, a lot of multilingual support services um, that, that we work through as well, um, and they try to coordinate together. Yeah, you, you've got a good team in, in South Portland. They've had to be um, come together because there are so many different needs. But you had a pretty good sized population of homeless students anyway in South yeah. Portland, even before that moment. But it's become even more apparent with 
the new mainers. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody else? Any questions that came up? I'll speak for our group. Um, one of the things that we identified was that um, there's more needs for education for um, general like staff and teaching staff um, and things like that. There's some lack of knowledge of about McKinney Vento just in general. So. Thanks for bringing that up. And that's a great conversation to have with your liaison to say, how can we provide that professional development? And if you can't figure out a way to do it now, um, then think about how can you do it for the fall? You know what? Because as crazy it is to think, you know, February, March, we are starting to plan for the fall trainings in schools. So now is also a chance to think about that. But you can do the um, professional development on McKinney Vinto at staff meetings just for 10 minutes, just to give a little blurb. Um, and at any point, you know, um, I can offer my services, but also Signe Lynch, who is the new interim um, McKinney Vinto state coordinator, is also happy to, to provide that support and that training. And we also have some community-based organizations um, who've been working closely with us who can also provide that support and training. But that's a great observation. Thank you. Anything else? If a, if a student has to see the doctor, um, I'm the coordinator for school-based health centers and they are um, McKinney Vento student. How do they get main care automatically? How does um, the bill, what happens with the bill? Do you know? Emily, do you have more complete information on that? Or I, I will, um, many of the students are already main care eligible, but not necessarily once they become homeless, they may need to have to apply for that. And then it becomes retroactive. Um, Emily, do you have any other no, information? It wouldn't be automatic. Um, McKinney Vento wouldn't be an automatic main care, but the, that might be the triggering of the McKinney Vento status might be a good a good reason to bring that up with the family to say, you know, what are you doing for health care? Should we um, can we assist you in, in applying for main care um, and get them hooked up that way? I know that um, our school based health centers will do that in the first appointment. If we send um, what, once we have a student registered, they will ask families about that and then um, set them up with the paperwork that they need to to get main care. So. What I can also I'll just, re, I'll I'll just reiterate. Is, I'll just reiterate what Christy said um, in regards to the school-based health center. Certainly, once you find out if a you know a family doesn't have insurance, and certainly with the expanded uh, income levels for main care, hopefully we'll see more kids be able to get on main care. But also, um, the liaison also is very helpful in helping families because a lot of times they need help in maneuvering the online. Uh, registration for main care. So um, liaison has been good for that. The other thing in the school-based health center world that I've uh, come to know is that they also uh, need a copy to scan into the patient's chart that they are a McKinney Vinto. So just putting that out there. Yeah, that they, they, you should write that in because that also gives them, thank you. I was just trying to look up all the charts and, and get that. So thank you, Emily, for putting that in there. Great questions. Anything else? Well, the, the link that I just put in the chat is actually the certificate for today's webinar. So I didn't oh. have the other link for you. But, oh. but for everyone who wants their certificate, that's there. I had forgotten to put it in a little bit ago. And there is a, um, a form that I was just trying to pull up very quickly and not doing as good a job and pulling it up very quickly is um, that students, um, you know, high school, particularly high school students, if they're unaccompanied youth, can access their own mental health and medical care. 
They don't need the signature of the adult. And there is a form that we will get to Emily and she can send it out to you and to Sarah. So I just um, don't have it right at the tip of my clicking finger. Anybody have any other uh, questions? Any other questions? Because I just want to throw up a couple of other slides. Okay, go ahead. Give me. So, um, wait a second. So, so what you can, whoops, you, you, Signe's, um information will be on here so you can access that. Um, Signe Lynch is the interim um, McKinney Vento specialist. And so any other questions you can ask her after this, or you can contact me directly. Um, just some things I thought I'd just share with you some additional quotes that I just wanted to leave you with. Um, this is from a liaison in Westbrook who said, um, we don't have the luxury of sleeping in a car because they don't. we don't own a vehicle. Um, and that's just sort of the reality for a lot of people. You know, we just assume that they have things in place that they really don't. Um, and here are two liaisons in the Waterford um, area, Massabesic area, that said that people are saying, I'm trying my best. I'm working different uh, times are tough and people are doing what they can to get by during these difficult times. So when you have in your school a clothing closet or food that's left out, it's not a stigma that this has to be for just homeless students but food that's just left out for anybody to access makes it feel like anybody can get it. And if you're homeless, you're not being stigmatized for that. Um, and, and the care that some of the older students are taking to take care of their siblings um, just shows that we're all in this together, you know, that everybody's in this together. Um, that's a copy of one. This is from South Portland. You know, um, and, and this was from Brian Kavanaugh just saying that they had a student that was in transitional housing and when she learned other people were homeless, she took action and wanted to make sure they had enough to eat. You know, it's sometimes easy to see the homeless student or family as simply the recipient. Um, it's easy to forget the amazing, empowering, inspiring things you can do to make an impact on the world. Um, around them, despite any barriers they may be experiencing, that that these are also the people who can be the supporters and work with you and provide that. So I want to, I know it's at 4.30, I want to thank you all for all the work you do every day, for every time you reach out to a family, for every time you listen to a student, it really does make a difference. And um, every student I talk to, they can remember the person. And I know from my teaching days that you don't always hear directly from the student at that time, but I have met students three, five years later that said, thank you for taking that time. So um, even if you don't hear about it right away, the work you do is appreciated every day. So thank you for all you do and please spread the word. Thank you, Susan.